finish up Joel this morning. Next week, the plan is to review the finances, uh, CLC finance report in preparation for the voters' meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. So next week, we'll take a break from our study of the Old Testament. And I am contemplating taking just a slight break from the prophets. There were a couple of other questions on our Bible class topic sheet that I thought I might try to plug in here as we're going along uh, that fit in connection with our study of the prophets of the Old Testament. So when we start back up in January, which would be what, January 3rd, is it the 10th or the 11th? Is it January 11th. 3rd or January 4th? It's the Sunday. Yeah. Fourth yeah. Fourth is the Sunday. It's the 11th. Yeah. So when we start back up on the 11th, um, I might take up a different topic before we jump into a new prophet from the Old Testament. The next one we're going to take a look at is Amos after Joel, but um, we'll see how that goes and I'll let you know next week. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord God, as we come before you and open your word this morning, we ask that you would send your spirit that we might grow in our knowledge and understanding of the great things that you have done for us. As we consider the words of Joel this morning, we ask that you would lead us to a deeper understanding and appreciation for the day of your judgment and the day of your grace in Christ Jesus. We recognize and confess that we are sinful just as the people of Joel was proclaiming to originally, and that yet, in spite of our sin, you have sent your Savior to deliver us from sin and from death and to open up the door to eternal life. Help us to uh, recognize the great sacrifice that you have made for sinners such as us and to serve you in all that we say and all that we do. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. We are on, in Joel chapter 3, we finished up with, uh, we started the second part of Joel last week, uh, the break came at Joel chapter 2, verse eight, 17 and 18, where we divided up the day of the Lord's judgment in the first half, and now moving on to the day of the Lord's grace in the second half. What was the big prophecy that we considered last Sunday? in the second part of Joel chapter 2. Anybody remember? The land was being promised. The land was promised forever and ever. Okay, there was the, there was the land promise that was talked about. Uh, at first he was going to destroy the land in the first chapter and a half. And then in the second part he, pr he promised that uh, he was going to give blessing. Uh, the, the land would, would become bountiful again. And when we talked about the land promise, there was something else that we discussed in connection with the land promise. What was that? That the land would always be theirs because Christ was going to come from it. Okay. And, and that land promise was very much connected to the Christ <coughs> promise, the Messianic promise. Once that promise was fulfilled, the land promise, it wasn't exactly null and void, but it is now contingent on their faithfulness, which had always been... Uh, ebbing and, and waning throughout their history. So the land promise was, was removed, basically, once the Christ had come. There was another aspect that we talked about last week. There were two aspects to the promises. What were the two aspects? What we might call... Well, kind of what's happening now and what's happening then. Okay. Or will happen. So there's an immediate fulfillment right here, right now, for the people of the Jews in the Old Testament at the time of Joel. The immediate fulfillment would have been what? Of God's promise. Taking care of, of things again. Okay, so Can giving that blessing it? again, yes. restoring the land to what it was before the locusts had come and destroyed everything. So that would have been the immediate promise. What was the greater and more distant promise then? Uh, beyond that even, the, the end of the world, 
the, and that's where we get to that day of the Lord's judgment, the, Lord, the day of the Lord's grace, comes ultimately on judgment day. So many of these prophecies that we see in Joel and many of the other prophets of the Old Testament has the immediate fulfillment for the present time, and then the ultimate fulfillment that is being pictured of the last day when Jesus returns again. And we talked a little bit last week about the phrases uh, Judah, Jerusalem, Zion, and how many times those picture what? The church, the Holy Christian Church. So it's beyond the, again, that's the immediate fulfillment would have been Judah at the time of Joel. The greater fulfillment is God's people throughout history. And that's what's so amazing about our study of the Old Testament is that when we look at these prophecies in that way, we recognize this is for me right now today, not just for the people of God's, uh, of, of God's nation in the Old Testament, but there's something for me in these words as well. We're going to see more of that in chapter 3, uh, and some of what we have seen as being more immediate in the prophecy at the time of Joel, we're going to see the more distant prophecy being fulfilled and spoken about as we move on into the, the third chapter. So uh, the, the final prophecy that we had that we talked a little bit about last week was the immediately fulfilled, or it was fulfilled on Pentecost, Peter says, in those days, uh, young men, uh, old men, men and women will prophesy in my name. And that was something that Peter said, this is fulfilled on, on Pentecost. And that was preparing the way for the day of the Lord also. So he says, I will, uh, and then he speaks about the fire, the blood, the smoke, the columns, uh, the sun will be turned in the darkness, dealing with the, the day of the Lord on judgment day. So we're taking up the verses right, follow, right, right after that prophecy in chapter 3. Let's take the first three verses to start off. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, a volunteer. For behold, in those days and at that time, I will bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. And I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there. <clears throat> On account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they ha have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy as payment for a harlot and a and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. All right, now we come, this section here comes to a little bit more of, um, there's a little bit of an immediate fulfillment and a little bit of a distant fulfillment in these verses. The, notice how Joel talks about restoring the fortunes. Can you read verse, the second part of verse 1 again, Wade, the last? When I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, anybody have anything different than that in verse 1? What do you have, Dory? In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, so notice Wade has captives, and the NIV goes with fortunes. This is one of those Hebrew words. Sometimes we have to... We have to wrestle a little bit with these when you go back to a, a, a language that's a dead language and try to figure out what a word means. Now, when, when I'm doing a study in the Old Testament and, and I'm translating from Hebrew into English, if I come across a word that I don't know, which there's a lot of, then I have to go to a lexicon. And the lexicon will give me a list of definitions for that word. And you have to kind of put it in the context and say, okay, which one of these which one of these fits the context best? Well, there are some Hebrew words. The reason, the way that a lexicon does that is that it uses uh, historical documents, not just biblical documents, but historical documents that would be used, and they take a look at how those words are used in giving us an opportunity or a translation. Well, there are some Hebrew words. In, in the Greek, it's called a hapax legomena. It means it's a word that, re that, that only occurs one time in the Bible. Well, if you, if you have a word that only occurs one time in the Bible, what do you have to compare it to? 
you might have a list of five different options, and you say, well, let's look at some of the other times and places where this word is used and see what it means in those verses. If there's only one, then you have a little bit of a, a, a difficulty. So sometimes in our translations, what we're dealing with is Hebrew words that are not used very often in our Old Testament. And because it's a dead language, it's not used anymore. You can't go to modern Hebrew and say, oh, you know, how is this word used today? So we're, we're limited, and so you get one that says fortunes, another one that says captives. That seems to be very different, doesn't it? Almost different contexts altogether. So some would take the New King James Version, and probably the King James Version also, would take this as a, a reference to the captivity, the Babylonian captivity. They were led away, and then the Lord's going to bring them back. Now, fortunes, that seems to be more connected to what we've actually read in Joel. They, their land has been decimated, it's been destroyed, but he's going to bl uh, bountifully bless the land again. He's going to restore the fortunes. So I think that's one of the reasons that the NIV and others go with the word fortunes. The captives, that's, while it's not foreign to the Old Testament, it does seem to be sort of foreign to Joel. That doesn't seem to be a topic that he deals with specifically in, in this book. So, but he's saying, I'm going to gather everybody together. Everybody who has hurt the nation of, of Israel or my people in the broad sense. And he says, I'm going to bring them down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there. You say, well, what's the Valley of Jehoshaphat? Anybody know who Jehoshaphat was? He was one of the kings. And if you have your handy dandy king list, ask yourself or find out whether Jehoshaphat was before or after the... Does anybody remember where we were? Who was on the throne at the time of Joel? You get bonus points, Kayla, if you can mention the name. <laughs> can I use the book? <laughs> you can use the book. I won't deduct any points. You don't have any points to deduct right now. I got penalized last time I used the book. Two points. I had to sit in the corner. <laughs> Remember the unique thing about Joel was that there was one word that wasn't mentioned. What was it? Oh, kings. Kings. He talks about elders, the elders of the people, gathering the elders, the priests, but no kings. So who was it that was on the throne? Anybody remember? Uh, well, we talked about it, it's probably during the period of the boy king's grandmother, Athaliah. Uh, so, what was Athaliah's grandson's name? Do you find him on there? Yep. Joash. Right? So, Joash would have been young, it might have been during the period while Athaliah was on the throne. So, where's Jehoshaphat? He's after that. He's after that? There's, there's another one there. So Jehoshaphat, this is a king that would have been, the people would have known. Now if you read in 2 Chronicles, we're told that Jehoshaphat went out to, uh, to go to a war against the Midians and a couple of other bands of people that gathered together. And, and there was this valley that they came to fight in, and he destroyed them. They called it the, the valley of, um, the valley, what was the name, valley of decision. You know, that's what Joel calls it. Um, no, I forget the name of it that's used in Chronicles. Uh, anyway, uh, most likely it's that valley that, that Joel is referring to. But he's probably not talking about a specific valley, but the fact that the, fact the Lord gave deliverance to his people through Jehoshaphat in that place. It's kind of like the word Armageddon in the book of Revelation. It's not discussing a specific location, but rather an event. And so the Lord is saying here that there's a day that's going to come when all of those who have raised up against my people, uh, the Holy Christian Church, will face my judgment the, in the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Valley of Decision. If you go to look at take, take a look at verse 14. Jump down to verse 14. Can you read that way? <coughs> Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And then back up to verse 12. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I sit, <coughs> excuse me, for there I will sit, O judgment, all the surrounding.
surrounding nations. Right. Okay, so you see the connection between the Valley of Decision, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. He's got two different names for it. And he's probably referring to a historical event to describe what the Lord is eventually going to do on the Day of Judgment. And if you think about Judgment Day, what is, what is God going to do? He's going to judge between those who believe in him and those who don't. We're dealing with the church and everybody else. Uh, that's exactly what Joel seems to be describing right here. He says, I'm going to gather all of my people. Uh, they've been scattered throughout the nations. We're not just dealing with the Babylonian captivity, the fact that they were scattered all over the ancient world. But look at how God's church is scattered today. And it doesn't matter where we are, we will come together, uh, we'll be brought together, and, and judgment will be leveled against those who have uh, destroyed, tried to destroy God's church, uh, hurt God's people, worked against God and his plan of salvation. So this, this immediately, it seems like there's an immediate fulfillment, but it, the, the greater fulfillment is taking place on Judgment Day when the Lord is coming to distinguish between believers and, and unbelievers. The verse 3, you read... Way is an interesting thing. This kind of describes the way in which the people have dealt with the, the, the nation of, of Israel. Uh, they have cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot, sold a girl for wine that they may drink. And in the next couple of sections, we're going to deal with the immediate historical context of those that were actually doing those kind of things. They would come in and for example, the, the, the Philistines, you think about Samson and the days of Samson, the Philistines would come in, they would raid the nation of Israel, they would take a bunch of prisoners, and they would either make them slaves or they would sell them, much like Joseph in the book of Genesis, uh, sold off in order to make a little bit of money. And so here the Lord is speaking about the, the judgment of those who have abused his people. But think about how that's done to Christians in a general sense. How they are... Um, uh, they are ridiculed by the world. Uh, they, in, you take a look at the theory of evolution and other aspects in which uh, the church is enslaved, if you will, to the teachings of the world. So there, there's a greater context to this also that, again, deals with our day today and how the church is, is being chained, if you will, and, and limited, uh, sold, in order to, to have a prophet. The, the world loves to make a prophet on Christianity. When um, thinking about Christmas and Epiphany here, uh, one of the things that, that uh, always gets me a little frustrated is when you see the wise men with the shepherds because the wise men weren't there on Christmas. And I, there were a couple of Christian publishing houses that, you know, they, they make these beautiful bulletins and they always have the star above the stable and the, the wise men are right there. So I actually called one of these, these, uh, these people that, that do these, these things. And I said, don't you, you know, haven't you read Matthew and Luke and don't you see that these are two different accounts? And you know what the guy told me? He said, yeah, I know, but they sell. <laughs> so the guy knew that it was wrong. But he said, I can make all kinds of, he said, those are the most popular ones. And so I've got to print them. And, and you know, that's the kind of thing that, that our world loves to make a little bit of money on the Christian Christ child story, you know, to, to fill their pockets. They don't care whether it's right or wrong or anything else. And, and that, that's one example of how people will take advantage of Christianity in order to further their, their own lives. So when you set up your nativity, do you have the wise men across the you room? you see the wise men? We don't even have the shepherds out there. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Shep shepherds got lost. No, I was thinking your house. No. Do you have your wise men across the room? <laughs> I do. In fact, when I was in Atlanta, we set up the, the uh, nativity scene. I put the, the nativity over here, and the wise men were on the other side of the church on their way over. So I got, got a little bit of grief for, for that, but um, I think it's, you know, it's important to make that distinction. People want to, there's the Christmas story and there's the Epiphany story. And the church throughout the history, throughout its history, has distinguished between those two events. Luke records the nativity event and Matthew records the visit of the wise men. And the church celebrated that, separated by 12 days, one on December 25th, the other one on January 6th. So it's, a, it's more of a modern thing to take those two and merge them into one. And most churches today 
don't celebrate Epiphany. So they want to, and I think that's part of it too, is they combine the two into to one event and celebrate it at one time. Everybody knows the 12 days of Christmas. What they don't know is that the 12 days of Christmas dealt with the, the Christian distinction between Christi, uh, uh, the Christmas story and the Epiphany story. So. I don't know, that poor Christmas tree is out in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. Uh, let's see. Any questions? One to three. Verses four through eight. A volunteer. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head, because you have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried into your temples my prized possessions. Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks, that you may remove them far from their borders. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your retaliation upon your own head, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sebans, Sabans, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Okay. Notice here we have some specific locations that are now mentioned. What's the first location that's mentioned? Tyre and Sidon. Uh, if you take a look at the map in the front of the back of your Bible, Tyre and Sidon. You know what Tyre and Sidon were known for? Yep, they were they were along the coast. So here's here's a, a map that I this is an older map from the Old Testament, but you've got the Mediterranean Sea here and the Dead Sea right in the middle. You go straight north of the Dead Sea, and then look along the coast of the Mediterranean, you find Tyre and Sidon uh, right on the coast. And that was the region. Does anybody have a, a, a country name? Phoenicia. Phoenicia. The Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were sailors. Uh, they built great ships, and they transported uh, cargo all over the Mediterranean Sea. Now, Phoenicia also happened to be one of the enemies of God's people in the, in the period of the Old Testament. Uh, the next group that we have, keep your hand on your map. What's the next name that's mentioned? Philistia. Okay, Philistia. If you go back to your map, the Philistines were down to the south, almost directly, which direction is that? That would be west of the Dead Sea. And that's also right along the coast. Those were the, that was the nation that was very prominent during the period of the judges. So you have the Philistines to the south, the Phoenicians to the north. And then, you've got another one. What's the last one? Well, this was not an enemy in this case, but the last one that you mentioned, uh, Emily. Okay, the Greeks are mentioned. Um, that's not going to be on your map because it's so far away. Okay. The Sabians? The, yeah, the Sabians. Now, the Sabians, how well do you guys know your uh, Middle Eastern geography? Have you ever heard of the country of Yemen? Okay, you know where it is. <laughs> Most people have heard of it, but they don't know where it is. Uh, the, the Yemenis would be what the, the ancient term would be the Sabians. Uh, so that would be in Arabia, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And he said, your, your, your people are going to be shipped off way, way down there. So you come in, you've enslaved my people, they've made raids. And this might have been one of the things that Joel was talking about, of these raids by the, the local nations, the Philistines, uh, the, the Phoenicians, which were enemies of, of the nation of Israel throughout its history. And, he, and this is an, a more immediate fulfillment again. Because you have done that, you've enslaved my people, now I am going to send judgment on you in immediate fulfillment. Your people are going to be sent into captivity and slavery and shipped all over the world to Greece and to Yemen. So you have this back and forth um, 
flipping between an immediate fulfillment right then and right there to the greater fulfillment in the future. And that's why a lot of people get frustrated with the, the books of the Old Testament because it doesn't seem to make any sense as you're reading through it. It's, it's flipping back and forth. But for Joel, as he looks ahead, he sees one event. It's, it's like a, a linear a linear event. Here's, here's Joel. And he's looking ahead. And he sees this one event, which would be the immediate um, for Judah at the time. And in the future, then, he also sees this greater uh, last day. Now, as you're looking ahead, it's, it's like looking, if you've ever been to Colorado or somewhere, you see this mountain in the distance. And there's actually two of them. They look like they're right next to each other. They're standing side by side. But when you get to the, the first one, you see the second one further off in the distance. As far as Joel was concerned, he's looking ahead. He sees these two events. <coughs> But from his perspective, you know, they, they don't seem to be distinct from one another. For us, now, here, here's us. We're right here. So it's easy for us to look two different directions and see that they're, they're not the same event. Uh, for Joel, as he looked ahead, many times one pictured the other, uh, it was a little bit different. And so that's one of the issues that we, we struggle with as New Testament believers. We're not looking at these events from the same perspective as the Old Testament prophets were. And we kind of have to put ourselves back in their place in order to recognize why some of these things come together. They separate them and they come back together again uh, because of the perspective that the Lord gave to them. And one eventually would, would say, hey, this, this is going to be uh, more greatly fulfilled in, on the last day. Any questions on verses 4 to 8? All right, let's take the longer section here. 9 to, let's go 9 to 16. Sure. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weaklings say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Immediate or distant? Got a little bit of both, doesn't it? Uh, you look at that final, the final two verses, sun and moon will grow dark. Uh, that's certainly distant, the, the last day. Uh, multitudes, verse 14, in the valley of decision, the day of the Lord is near. That could be a little bit of both. There could be multitudes uh, from one perspective of all the ones that the Lord is gathering together for judgment as he judges individual nations. But probably the distant, the more distant fulfillment of the last day where all the world is gathered before God and he levels the judgment against them. Um, there's a couple of interesting things here. And some of these verses might sound, any, any of these verses sound just a little bit familiar? Thank you. 
ears in the pruning hooks. Nations, nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. All right. So One more time, Gala. Yeah, they're flip flops. You notice that? Yeah. So Joel comes first. Joel says what? He says we're going to beat our plowshares into spears. What's the what's the implication? War. Prepare for war. Isaiah, who comes later, says take your swords and beat them into plowshares, which implies what? Peace. Peace. Uh, notice the difference between the two. So that's what I was asking. Which one was Johnson using? It would have been Isaiah's, wasn't it? Preparing for war? It, it just sounded like... Yeah, you, you hear it, and you don't. sometimes we don't recognize that there are two different ones. Um, Isaiah flip-flops it. He says, hey, we're, we're preparing for... You were preparing for war, now we're preparing for, for peace. But the, the Lord is saying, hey, the judgment is coming. You can do anything you want. You can, you can take your plowshares and you can turn them into swords. It's not going to change the fact that the judgment is coming. But he says, prepare for war because that day is coming. The day of judgment, the day of decision is coming against the world when they will stand before God. Emily, did you have a thought there? Sorry. Did you have a thought? I thought you were trying to say something earlier. No. No. Somebody else? Sometimes I have to slow down. <laughs> uh, so, put it, put it in the circle. Yes. What I was going to say is we're so used to hearing uh, beat your plowshares into swords. And when we see the reverse, it doesn't register. Right, you, you still think. Because when, when it was red, I just thought it was right. the same, it was the same one. Right, it was the same one. Right. I think we're probably more familiar with the Isaiah one mm -hmm. than with the Joel one. Mm -hmm. Typically, Isaiah is read a little bit more regularly. But you're right, we might have heard it, and I don't know which, which people think of. You know, if, if they think of preparing for war, think of preparing for peace when they hear that. But now you know that it, it occurs both ways, and you've got to ask yourself, hey, which one is this? Is this indicating peace? Is this indicating war? And you can see the context of Joel. Joel is saying, hey, uh, this is not going to be a pretty sight. Uh, get your battle, battle gear on and be ready. And you'll notice how he, we've been talking about the locusts in chapter 1 and the devastation that's coming. And then in chapter, the end of chapter 2 and moving into chapter 3, the Lord says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bountifully bless you. Notice how Joel takes that now and he twists it just a little bit. He says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread, for the wine press is full. We talked about the harvest and the grapes earlier. The, the, the Lord's going to bless the nation and, and give that prosper, uh, prosperity back. But now he twists it and he says, the vats overflow for their wickedness is great. He's dealing with a different type of harvest now. He's not dealing with the immediate fulfillment of granting blessing to the land, but rather the fact that the, the, the Lord is coming. The time is, is coming where the Lord is going to have to bring in the harvest. And this is what Jesus uses in the New Testament. All of those analogies of the harvest, the fact that the man sowed the seed and he waited for the seed to come up, and then the, you know, the angels, he sends the angels in, the reapers, in order to cut the harvest down and to separate the wheat from the tares. All of those parables and stories which Jesus uses are drawn from Joel. This concept of the day of judgment being a day of harvest. And that's kind of a neat thing. We, we talk about you know, hearing a sermon that Jesus would have preached. But he was so familiar with the Old Testament. When he was 12 years old, and he went to Jerusalem, and he was sitting there, and he was teaching the leaders of Israel. At 12 years old. I imagine... Imagine 20 years later, you know, at 32, when, when he's had that many more years to go through and, and study the Old Testament and, and to preach and to speak on that. And it's no wonder that the people of Jesus' day during his ministry said, this guy isn't like all the other rabbis around. This guy is one who speaks with authority. He knows what he's talking about. He references the Old Testament. That would have been very, very different from the Jews of Jesus' day who... The rabbis of Jesus' day didn't have a, 
I don't want to say they didn't have a high regard for the Old Testament because they did in a way, but their, their authority didn't come from the Old Testament. It came from some other rabbi before them. It's kind of like uh, your, your Bible and, and the study notes. You know, what's the authority? Is it the notes in the Bible or is it the Bible itself? And a lot of people say, oh, it's the notes in the Bible. That, that's what explains everything else. No. It's the Bible that explains the notes and tells you whether the notes are good or bad. Uh, that's the way we have to look at it. But that was the view of the people of the Old Testament. They said, hey, let me go back to Rabbi so-and-so, and he says this, so this is why this is right. And Jesus was different. We talked about this in, in uh, um, the Wednesday, uh, Friday Bible study with Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he came on the scene... He didn't say, well, let me tell you what Rabbi so-and-so said. He said, most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, this is the way it is. And when you talk about the, every witness shall be established, or every word shall be established by two or three witnesses, you know, they took that seriously. You've got to have two or three rabbis that back you up. Jesus comes on the scene and he says, most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you. Jesus was his double witness himself. Uh, he was saying, I don't need anybody to back me up. Uh, I have the Word of God. So very, very different. Kind of like our own day to, um, in the churches today, where churches set the Bible aside and they say, you know, let me tell you what my experience is. Jesus said, forget your experience. Forget Rabbi so-and-so. Let me tell you what the Word of God says. And that's where we need to go back to once again. Uh, that's, that's where it is. That's, that's where the power is. Well, and that's what set the rabbis different. They didn't have written the Word neither to rely on. At that time. They, at the time of Jesus? Well, yeah, or any, before it was put into print. I mean, it was... Well, they had it at Jesus' day. When Jesus went to Nazareth, he pulled the scroll off of the shelf. They had the, the Old Testament was, they didn't have the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Right. They just had one. I yep. mean, they had to go one place to read it. Right, yeah, they would go, yeah. right. You, yeah, they didn't have books right. like we have today where they right. could take it home. You're right, right. Yeah, that, that was a little bit different, too. Although, what's amazing about that is, you know, I uh, ask you a question today and, and if somebody wants to get an answer, what do they do? Whip out their phone, check Google, <laughs> Wikipedia. Oh, uh, yeah, this is what the answer is. Uh, and, you know, they'll read. I, I, if I say, what's the Gettysburg address? Somebody's going to whip out their phone, look it up on Wikipedia. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this nation, a new, okay, uh, on this continent, a new nation. Well, back then, because they didn't have that, they would take the, the Old Testament or the New Testament, they would break it up, they would share, you know, the, the Rombergs, this week you guys get Joel. Uh, Nasons, you guys get Amos. Thenemans, we'll give you Hosea. So everybody takes it for a week or a month, they memorize it, and then they switch. And then they memorize another one. And so they were exercising their brains a little bit more than we do today. And it wasn't that they didn't have it, they had it in a different way than we had it today. But, you know, the the, the way in which we think we're so advanced today and the technology that we have only dumbs us down because we don't depend on what God has given to us and you know, we depend on something else instead. So it is kind of amazing. Have you ever heard this guy that, that travels around and he recites the entire book of Matthew? He has the entire book of Matthew memorized and he will recite it uh, he does Matthew, John, there's several, and you can ask him for several different books he has memorized, and he'll to read them. Literally, for four hours or whatever it is, he will recite this book of the Bible for you. And it's not like it can't be done, but we haven't, you know, in, in our modern world, we don't train ourselves to do that anymore. All right, <clears throat> anything else? 9 to 16. Got five minutes for five verses. 17 to 21, the last section, a volunteer. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravens of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste. 
because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem through all generations. Their blood guilt, well, I have not, which I have not pardoned, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. Immediate for future. Yeah, look at the look at the. As you read through these verses, look at the end of verse seventeen. Uh, you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in, in Zion, my holy mountain, Jerusalem will be holy. Strangers will pass through it no more. When would that immediately be fulfilled? It, it didn't, did it? There, there was not a time when people didn't pass through Jerusalem. You go down a little bit further. It will come about in that day that the mountains will drip with sweet wine. Now there's some picture language here, but hills will flow with milk. The brooks of Judah will flow with water. Spring, a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to valley the uh, to water the valley of the Caches. This is, I mean, this is like the the streets paved with gold, the pearly gates. This is picture language that's describing the uh, heaven. Uh, this this beautiful place we hear about the the land flowing with milk and honey when the, the spies went into the land of Canaan. Uh, but the Lord is describing a, a perfect place that he is going to establish for his people. This is a picture of heaven. And then you have the contrast, verses 19. Uh, Egypt will become waste. Edom will become desolate because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. Uh, remember we talked about Edom? Which prophet was sent to Edom? Not Jonah. You got to go back Nahum. further. Not Nahum. Obadiah. 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 Obadiah was the one that was sent to the Edomites. Uh, to that was the land to the south. They were related. They were the descendants of Esau. The very first book that we considered. So we've talked a little bit about the Edomites. Egypt. We saw what Egypt did when when they enslaved the, the nation of Israel for 400 years. So here's two events that, that are talked about quite a bit in the Old Testament. He says they're going to be judged for their, uh, their harming uh, the people of God and preventing the plan of God's salvation. But Judah will be inhabited forever, Jerusalem for all generations. Again, pretty, pretty broad words that couldn't be fulfilled immediately. This is dealing with the hope of, and the comfort that we have in, in eternity. I will avenge their blood which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So as you take a look at these verses, Zion, Jerusalem, Judah, Zion, in these last five verses, we're dealing with the Holy Christian Church. Uh, we're not dealing with the uh, specifically the immediate fulfillment of Judah, Jerusalem, and Mount Zion, but the fact that this describes God's people throughout, throughout history. Any thoughts on Joel? a lot more there than three, three chapters. <laughs> yeah, some of these, some of these prophets, I mean, yeah. because we are so distant from it, it is more difficult for us. Mm -hmm. I think the people of the Old Testament at the time of Joel understood it a whole lot better in, in many ways than we can today. Mm -hmm. But it's well worth our time and consideration as we recognize that there isn't, it's not just things that have already been fulfilled, there are things that are yet to be fulfilled that we are a part of. So anything else on Joel? So next week we'll take a break and then we'll pick it up with, um, with probably a different topic on the following week and then we'll go on. If you want to get started on Amos, Amos is a little bit longer. We've had some pretty short ones thus far, three or four chapters. Uh, the next couple of prophets are going to be longer ones. Amos and Hosea are both pretty good sized. And I don't know that we will take, take them and break them up the way that we have some of the shorter ones. If we started doing that, we wouldn't get into, we wouldn't get finished with Amos and Hosea until I'm a lot greater than I am. So anything else? We have Bible class, but we're going to go through the financial, CLC financial report in preparation for the voters meeting.
So we'll have, it won't be, I guess, literally Bible class. It'll be Bible class time for something else. Let's close with the, the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 